Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you all for coming today. Uh, we're waiting on a few more people, and so they'll trickle in. So um, if someone sits beside you and they don't have a handout, you can you know, whisper to them when it's up there. There's two of them that they could sign in for us. Um, but we brought in Bree Benscombe today, and I'll introduce her in just a moment. But um, just looking at websites, and I know that that's a troublesome thing for you know every unit and department to kind of deal with so much content and to you know really put it out there in a nice way where students can read it and learn about it and we get the information that we want. So I spoke with Kathy Johnson and I was like, you know, it'd be great if we had someone that's experienced in this to come in and kind of talk about what are some resources for us? What are you know some best practices that we can do with our websites to better them and just you know spend more time on that process and to kind of get a process evolved from that without having to, you know, hire more staff to come in and look specifically at the website because I know that none of us really have a person that just you know sits there all day and thinks, oh, it's something great to put on the website today or what can I change or rewrite today? A lot of times we're scrambling to you know figure out how are we going to get that content up? Where are we going to put it? You know, what order is it going to go in? Who's going to write it? Who's going to proofread it? All of that. So, um, so Bree Dunscombe has 11 years of experience in um, web writing and content creation, um, and you know that's also attached to higher ed, which is a you know a great benefit for us. That you know just having someone that comes in here and and writes websites, maybe for a business or a nonprofit, that may not translate well to here. But she's had a lot of experience, especially in nursing programs. Um, I know of uh, coming up with different content, not only just for websites, but also for brochures. So I will turn it over to her and welcome and thank you today. And uh, she has encouraged us to you know, ask questions as the presentation is going on. So if something pops in your head or you have a specific example from your website that you want to know about, you know, this, this session's for you and it's personalized for um, our website. So make sure that you ask those. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for coming today. I know that this is on your lunch hour. And website writing is not your primary responsibility, so the fact that you want to learn more and that you're taking time out of your own schedule to come here means a lot, so thanks for being here. Okay, so we've got about 30 or 40 minutes of presentation that I plan to give you guys, and then about 15 minutes scheduled at the end for Q&A. Feel free, like Eric said, to interrupt me if there's a question that you have, if, if something doesn't make sense, or you just want a little bit more information on the spot. I'm, I'm here for you guys, so if you guys don't get your questions answered, then I'm not doing a good job. So we've got three different topics that we're going to hit today. Um, the first is defining what it means to have a website strategy, um, you know, why is it important to have a plan for your web content, and um, what do you do with that when you have one. Um, establishing goals for your web content is a big one. What do you want your content to do for you? What do you want students to get out of the web pages that you're putting out for them? We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, trademarks of effective web content, and this is specific to um, the copy that's on your pages. Um, with some do's and don'ts of things you want to make sure you're keeping in mind and things that you want to avoid. Um, and then evaluating your web content. Um, I did um, surf the, the UC website and, and look at the student services tab and. Um, I'm not going to be calling out specific examples from your pages, um, but I have looked, I have skimmed them and have some general suggestions. Um, so if you have something, if you have a specific question about your page, feel free to, to let me know. But um, I just kind of looked at everything that you guys have going on and, and just use that to inform the presentation. And then at the end, I think you guys have this handout already. I just included a very simple Excel document that can be used as a, a web content audit template that kind of puts in some of the questions that we talk about today, when, uh, questions that you want to ask about your own web content. So it's not the most beautiful handout. I'm sure that you'll find fancier ones on the internet, but this is just something to get you guys started knowing, again, that this is not your primary job function and you're just trying to make your content the best that it can be and we're not talking about you know, rebranding University College or starting from scratch, this is just to help you guys do better what you're already doing. And so just a, a little bit more about me. Uh, like Eric said, I've got 11 years of marketing communications. And my first job was actually for my alma mater. Um, it was St. Joseph's College in Rensselaer, Indiana. So I was pretty fortunate coming out of my senior year of college that they needed, um, that they needed a director of, of publications. And one of the things that I did right away that I assisted with was watching the college go through a rebrand. They did a brand new website, tagline, um, marketing campaign, things of that nature. Um, 
was in that position for three years and then I moved to Indianapolis and worked for AIT Laboratories over, started out near the old airport and it's now closer to the Traders Point area. So taking what I learned in higher ed and then applying it into a corporate setting. And for the last year, I've been working for a company called Orbis Education. It's been an interesting mix of, of higher ed because we work for higher education for colleges and universities, but Orbis itself is more of a business mindset. So taking some more um, corporate lead generation strategies and applying those to higher ed. So I feel like having all these different experiences at least gives, puts me in a good position to give you guys a lot of ideas what to do. Um, like I said, I'm not the expert on your websites, you guys are. So this is just kind of ideas and recommendations of things that you can do on your own, but definitely not telling you remove X, Y, and Z, do this or that. Just take the ideas that, that I've got and see how they work well for you. So again, yeah, it's to uh, do what you're already doing. I have a soft spot for higher ed. I felt like I loved I loved being a student. I would go to school forever if time and money were not, were not an issue. Um, but once I became an employee, I loved seeing how hard employees work on the other side of the, of the table, helping students get everything they need to be ready for class and make sure they're successful. So um, I love being a student, but I love working around colleges even more because you can see the amount of work that it goes into making sure that a student has everything they need to be successful. I'm really happy to be able to be here and help you guys. Okay. Defining website strategy. I feel like strategy is one of those buzzwords that you can use when you were talking about like generic corporate settings like solutions or um, all kinds of other things that people talk a lot about these words, but it's not really clear what you mean. So I wanted to really make sure that you guys know where I'm coming from when I talk about having a website strategy. So when I say it, I really mean a content strategy as it applies to the web. Um, you know, content, having a, a plan for how you deal with content is not just based on, on a website. Content goes into all kinds of different places, brochures, advertising, things of that nature. But websites really are the, seem to be the driving force these days because um, content management systems make it easy for a lot of different people to get involved and, and help out with websites. Um, once you've got your content management system set up, it's, it doesn't always cost a lot of money. It just depends on the initiative that you've got. Um, and websites have such a high reach for everybody. So, um, so it's general content strategy in general would uh, would be for everybody. But we're just talking specifically about how it applies to the web. Um, and one of the things that makes websites um, so another thing that makes it so great is that traditional marketing has really been turned <coughs> upside its head in the last few years. Um, it used to be that uh, if you wanted to get your messages across to people, that billboards and print advertising and, and TV and radio really did a lot to raise awareness about a school and, and get information out to students. But it's really easy to tune those things out now. You can have a DVR and you can skip commercials and can listen to sat satellite radio and never turn on radio um, in your you know, regular radio in your car, um, but when people are looking for information on people looking for information in general, they're usually going to Google or Bing or some other search engine and typing in exactly what they want to know. Um, and so websites are great to be there for people to show up when when they have a question about what you do, um, you know, to have all that content available for them. And so instead of instead of um, pushing information out to people that may not be relevant. Now it's more of a, a poll strategy where you're pulling them in based on the information that you know they want from your from your website. And so uh, instead of putting out canned messages that you might see and that you used to see in traditional uh, marketing in years past, now it's more about being much more service oriented. How you can help students, how you can solve a problem and make their lives easier. Like that's what they're looking for when they come to your to your website. So just making sure that you can uh, you know how you can help them. And so this is the content strategy is all going to tie into those types of basic principles. Um, and content is, just, is anything you produce that people consume. So, um, and content can be consumed and packaged in all kinds of different ways. You know, we're talking specifically about websites right now. Blogs are an important part of a website, or they can be standalone sites on their own. Social media, like Facebook, Twitter, um, all those other social channels. Um, images and graphics, they've got infographics now. Those are all just individual pieces of content, videos, books, guides, podcasts, apps. Um, and the mix that you have is just based on the resources that you're able to sustain over time. And so again, that's what makes websites just a big deal because most people can sustain that on some level. Um, 
and is not requiring them to um, to do any multimedia outside of that if they, if they don't want to. I found this nifty little quote um, on meetcontent.com and I thought it was worth sharing. Your website is both a marketing tool and a customer service tool. Content strategy helps you plan for both. Um, and I think for university colleges, you guys are in a unique, um, a unique situation um, because you guys are geared towards students who are already admitted into the college for the most part. So the customer service tool is a really big deal for you because you want to make sure that students are, are happy with their experience and getting the information that they need. But your website is not an intranet. It's not something that only current students have access to. So anybody can be looking at your content just based on the types of things that they're searching into Google. So your site is also a marketing tool, even if it's not being used that way by the college as a whole. Um, so just something to keep in mind that <coughs> even though we're writing for students, this could be helpful to a much larger body. Um, it could show up to a prospective student who's looking at different colleges and they find their way into your website or if they, if they type in a search term in Google, that brings you to them. And so current students are your primary focus, but it's just good to know the other types of people that could be coming to your site based on the content that you have. Um, and so the, the impression that a prospective student would get of university college is helping them to make a decision about IUPUI as a whole. So again, not that you're trying to write for 20 different audiences, but it's just good to keep in mind that your content will have a, a wide reach. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing for your college. Okay. So things that you want a content strategy to do for you. Uh, identify which content is valuable to your audience and which isn't. Deciding where content belongs. Um, it may be you may have some great information that you know needs to be somewhere, but um, that doesn't necessarily mean it belongs in your section of the website. Um, so just being mindful of the things that will help be, be most valuable um, in your section. Um, and then budgeting time on creating new content and updating existing content. Um, again, I'm very aware that this is not your full-time job. And so, like Eric said, it's not like you're sitting at your desk and wondering, what can I do to, to make my website great today? Um, you want to have a strategy that is sustainable for your situation um, and making sure you're not adding content that's going to add burden to you over the long haul um, when you're trying to figure out where to spend your time in a week. And, you know, very honestly, the website might not be something that you're touching every week. Um, and so it's important to keep that in mind when you have ideas for new pages so that you're not, um, you're not putting undue burden on yourself to update content that maybe isn't in your best interest to be touching week in and week out. Um, maybe that's something to bring up to Eric. So these are the types of um, things that we'll be talking about today. Um, and having a, a, a content strategy for your website can also help you answer two key questions. Why does your website exist? And what do you want visitors to do once they're there? And I think that these can be tough for colleges and universities because sometimes the honest answer doesn't look good on paper. And it's not something that you would um, that you would necessarily share with, with, with everybody. So I have a website because XYZ University, they have this page on their website, so we want to have the same page. Or um, I'm not sure what I want to, what I want a student to do when they're on my site, but um, but this information has to live somewhere, and I don't know I don't know where else to put it. Um, I think I think all businesses have this problem to an extent, but I just think there are so many hands um, in higher ed websites that um, knowing what to do with the website can be hard. If you've got 40 different opinions on on what should be going on and input from all kinds of colleges and what the student wants to, to see. So having some kind of strategy in your head where you want to go can be very helpful in making decisions on the fly if, if people come to you and want to add more content or again as you have ideas for things to do with your own content. So we want we'd like to have we'd like to have good answers here. So, establishing goals for your web content. Again, I, my goal in here was not to come in and tell you that you're doing everything wrong or that I have a brand new approach to your website. I really just took the tools of what you guys already have and are trying to put it together into some um, into suggest some suggestions that would be meaningful to you. So I started with um, the basic purpose of, of university college in general. And so I just found this right off your website um, that your gateway for entering IUPUI students in order to provide advising, first year seminars, career services, and other forms of support to ensure that students move into their majors as efficiently as possible. And so as a, a newcomer coming into your site, seeing that, um, like I was happy to see that. It's nice to know um, what a student should expect to get from, 
from your services in general. Um, and I think that you guys actually do have a lot of good elements to help you fine tune fine tune your strategy for web content. And so I just kind of I just kind of broke it down using those questions that I, I just showed you. So the first one being why does your website exist? And so again, me and newcomer looking in on your site, um, you're here to provide tools and resources that help students enter their school of choice. And so if we're trying to figure out what what kind of what what kind of web content would be most valuable to students who are wanting to enter into their school of choice? Um, again, just picking uh, information that was already on your site. Um, it's going to help them define a career path, help them pick a major, and help them raise their academic profile to be accepted by their school of choice. Um, and so I put those in bold because to me those are the mo among the most important things that you can do for students because they are it, it's something tangible that means something to a student. Um, you know, if they come in and they don't have, uh, and they don't know what they want to do um, with their within their college career, they're coming to you guys for that help. So they're going to hopefully walk away having some kind of a roadmap for what they want to do with their career. Um, they need to pick a major while they're here, um, so that again, that's something tangible that they can do if they go from being an undecided major to a business major. You help them, you help them make a significant make significant progress in their uh, in their time here. And then helping them uh, have an academic profile, have high grades, etc., that will get them into the school once they identify where they want to be. Um, the other important thing is um, that makes these so important is that I think that they give you guys some really great tools to work with. Um, the three at the bottom, becoming familiar with IUPUI and creating a support system, forming a community, those are very important, but it's also very hard to measure on your end to know to know if you're being successful or not because the students' impressions of all of these things are not just in your hand. So um, if someone gets a tutor and they have a bad experience with their tutor, you know, if, if they were to get a survey and ask what they thought of the, of the university college service there, um, you guys may have done everything right in terms of matching them with the tutor, making sure they had services, but if those two people didn't get along very well, that could sour their impression of the experience as a whole. Um, and so it's, it's just a very soft, subjective thing to measure. But you definitely can track whether somebody, you know, came in and, and didn't know what to do with their, what they wanted to do in their career, and you help them outline a path. Or again, if, if they didn't have a major before, they do now. Those are things that are very, that are objective that you can measure and say, hey, the content on our website is helping students do all of these things because if you pull a report and you see, you know, 20 percent of our students are now have, have a specific major where from the undecided pool, that sh that is tangible data that shows you that you're moving in the right direction. So I think anything that we can do, that anything that you guys can do to help drive students to one of those kinds of behaviors will, will be in your best interest and also in theirs. Because if they don't do these things, their their success in college is compromised. So we really want to make sure that they are getting getting tangible things that um, out of their experience with, with university and college. Any questions on that? Establishing goals for your web content. Second question: What do you want visitors to do on your site? Um, this is a little bit more targeted than just knowing what um, what mission you want to fulfill. Uh, so you know, we're talking about we want students to be able to pick a major, um, identify a career path, and things of that nature. But they're not going to do that on your website. They're not going to visit a page and and, and be able to <coughs> select a drop down to see that they have a major now. So your um, the actions that you have on your website are driving them to those overall behaviors. So again, coming from uh, <coughs> looking at my corporate experience and, and, and lead generation, um, it's all about um, making sure you know what you want a student to do when they get on your website. So things that are very tangible and, and uh, intentional could be downloading a guide, taking <coughs> a survey, filling out a form, registering for an event. It could even be just driving them to other content on your website. It doesn't always have to be um, something physical that a student fills out or does. But um, but know what you want them to what, know what you want them to do when they're on a certain page, um, and the common thread throughout all of these things is is engagement. Um, engagement on a website <coughs> is what keeps it from just becoming a static a website be, becoming a, an electronic brochure of of your content. Um, you want you want students to be able to interact and engage with you. And I know that I believe it was the same audience that had some social media presentations in the last few months, and so I'm sure. You guys have a lot of great tips that you've taken from that in terms of engaging with students on social media, but it doesn't only have to happen there. 
it'll look different on a website, but it's still it's still great to give students something physical that you want them to do um, when they're on your site. Um, and again, it could it doesn't always have to be something this physical, but again, this is very trackable. Um, if someone is taking the time to, to download a PDF or if taking a survey, um, it's showing that they want the content that you have to give them. So it's very easy to measure intent that way, whether you're just tracking whether or not they move to another page of the site, that's a lot more possible. It doesn't take much of an investment for them to click from one page to another, but it can still be very important. So again, my the, the, the second half of my background encourages me to tell you, get them to do something while you're there. That, and if they're doing these things, it means they're interested in what you have to say, and it shows that you're doing you're doing the right things. Trademarks of effective web content. You can find you could probably find 20 or 30 million lists online about what you want content to do for you and um, what content should be. And again, I just this presentation is very specific to you guys. So we're trying to give you guys tips that are things that you could actually work into your day to day. Um, so I boiled it down to four different you want content to be relevant, unique, easy to read, and accurate. Um, and so I'm going to take these one by one, and this is where the do's and the don'ts are going to come in, and what I'm going to show you just a couple of examples for, for a few of these. So the first one is relevant. Um, and so this goes back to the fact that you want to offer valuable content to your students, um, something that is going to mean something to them, to them. So you do want to make their lives easier. Are you solving a problem for them? Are you giving information to them that they wouldn't have been able to find anywhere else? Or would it be a lot harder to find if they didn't have it at your site? Um, helping them solve a problem, like I don't know how to pick a major. Um, helping them make a decision if they're trying to decide between two different majors or two different career tracks. But, but the information that you're giving them is, is going to make their life easier. It's going to help them do something to move forward um, in their academic career. Um, do put important information at the top. And so this, um, this applies to website navigation as in addition to content that's on the actual page. So making sure that if there are certain pages that you want them to get to that they don't have to get, it doesn't take that five or six clicks to actually find them. Um, that it would be at a, a higher position in your, in your navigation. Um, and then also on page. So um, the meat and potatoes of, the, uh, of that actual content, making sure it's higher at the page as opposed to at the bottom. Don't bury it. And there are other ways that you can highlight important information as well that don't have to do necessarily with web pages that you may or may not be able to get some assistance on. Uh, you'll see little website banners that sit in the sidebar if you're driving to something specific, um, things of that nature. And so that could be something that, like if you had a career guide and you wanted to make sure that somebody saw it on the main page of University College, um, you know, that's something that if you were able to get that multimedia assistance, that could be something that's, that could work for you. But at the very least, making sure that the that you're starting with the most important information at the top and then funneling down. Um, and then creating pages that are sustainable. Um, so when you're creating new, before you create a new page, ask yourself how long that information is going to be valuable to somebody. So that you're not creating a page that it works really well for four or five months and then it kind of the, the passion for it dies off a little bit and then you're just left with one more page that you don't have to account for day in and day out. Um, there are lots of different places that you can put more short-term or time-sensitive information, but be pretty protective of what you're adding to your core navigation because it is something that is going to, you're going to be looking at every time you're evaluating the website. Um, and so I think um, you know blogs are a great thing for that, where you can put out uh, information that is, is time-sensitive, that doesn't have to be you know gone back and updated three months from now because a blog is a real-time living thing. Um, so uh, social media updates, things like that. So again, just be really protective of what you consider your core content to be for when it comes to static web pages. And if you're creating a new one, it's something that should mean something to students over the long term. And that would seem like a burden to update down the road. And then when it comes to just a couple of don'ts, um, again, don't treat your website like an internet. Um, and again, I know every website I've been a part of, there have been pages where they just need to live somewhere and they, the content just needs to be accessible to to the staff in some way, and sometimes we don't even care if students see it, it just needs to live somewhere to say that we have it. Um, just try to do that less and not more, um, because a student will see all of the pages that are on their site, so making sure that it means something to them. Um, 
and then don't create more content that you can realistically manage, um, going back to creating pages that are sustainable. And so I have an example of this for you. Um, I did some searching on some different uh, websites for college here in Indianapolis, and that's the site that I have been a part of. And so this page comes from Marion University, and this is the, the first page that you come to for their academic support and counseling tab. Um, and so I thought this was a great example of relevant because it's putting the student in the driver's seat when it comes to um, helping them figure out what they're doing, like what they, what they might get out of the services on this page. So the, that subhead is saying, you might come to the one-year counseling center because you want to tutor in a difficult course, you're homesick, you're having trouble managing your time, and so on. It's identifying all these different problems that students may typically have when they're a student, and now we're telling them where they can go to, to get some of that information or to get questions answered. Um, so I just love that it was a more um, it was a more visual, more specific um, list of reasons that a student cares that you exist, and ways that you can help a student. And then it goes right into the next section. You might have come to the internships and career services offices if you're not sure what to major in. You've heard it's a good idea to do an internship and so on. So it's taking this one page breaking out all the different services that fall under this tab and giving them tangible examples of why they would want to take advantage of those services. So the student app has a clear picture of what they can get from you. Um, and it's also a very easy to read thing, which we'll talk about um, on the next slide. Um, it's plain language, it's quick bullet points, it's easy for the student to read because we know people don't spend careful time and energy reading websites, they're scanning most of the time. And so a student could scan this and get an and figure out where they fit in, which of these services would be more, um, if they're trying to figure out where to even start, uh, this list can kind of help them figure out maybe which office within the academic support services that they want to tackle first. Um, so again, this is just an, exa this is just an example. Um, and it's implied that we can help you with all of these problems. You can come to us with your home, so we can give you some coping tips or, or tools or connect you with other students who are having the same problem. Um, so you're, you're putting the student's problem out there, but it's implied that you have a solution to that. So again, if we're talking about relevant content, I thought this helps make this, these student services relevant to the student. Okay. I have another example of relevant for you, it turns out. And this is a blog post um, for one of the schools that we work for, but I don't think that this is inappropriate to put content in a static web page like this. So one of the blog topics that we had was four questions to ask in an advising program for nursing school. It's Orvis focuses on nursing schools. And so this, again, puts the student front and center and helps them understand what they're going to get out of coming to one of our campuses and, and having an appointment with an academic advisor. Um, so maybe they have these questions, maybe they don't, but they should have these questions, right? We want them to know um, the types of things that are important to them, types of questions to ask that would help them get an idea that one of our nursing programs is a good fit for them. So you know, a lot of these are coming from FAQs, but, um, but some of them are, are questions that we have that a student should understand. Maybe they don't have, maybe they don't know how to ask the question. Um, and so we put those out there for them. So, so again, it's putting the student in the driver's seat and, and giving them information that is relevant to them and not just relevant to us. And information that will help them move forward in the next step of the process, wherever they are. With, it, with uh, academic advising or admissions advising, as in this case it is. Okay, this was just a funny graphic I found um, while I was putting this presentation together. Um, and so this the circle on the on the left is things on the front page of a, a typical university website, and on the right, things that people go to the site that they're actually looking for. Um, and the only overlap between the two circles is the full name of the school. So I just think it's a it's a good reminder that you know we have lots of on our end we have lots of things that we want to make sure a student sees that are important to us you know seeing things like alumni reviews and promoting campus events and a lot of the times the students need is much simpler so again it's just something to kind of keep in mind as we're putting content together um, and I did link to the source if you want to um, look at it yourself and there's about 300 more not just university um, cartoons but a bunch in general. Again, just good things to keep in mind. We want to give information that is practical to a student. Okay. So the next, there we go. Um, so the next thing, um, next thing about the content is unique. Um, 
So when it comes to dues, um, we're offering something concrete to people. It kind of answers the so what. Like, okay, you're giving, this, giving me this information. Like, it's your answer so what. Like, why does this mean something to them? Like, a student, why, why do I care about this? Um, explaining the content in your own words, um, you know, so that it's coming from, the, from your voice. Um, you know, we don't want to just lift paragraphs from other sites and, and, and put it in our own content. Again, you can take ideas from other places, um, but you want to keep the, uh, the tone of your own website consistent. So try to put things in your own words and, and not just always or sometimes taking you know, four or five sentences and, and putting it in the middle of the, the page as a quote. Really taking the time to, to talk about it in your own words so a student knows what they're supposed to get out of it. Um, consider a word count. Um, if you're putting a, a new piece of content together, um, and you only have a paragraph or you know a couple of little paragraphs to say about it. I would I would just challenge you to reconsider if, if the web page is really if a brand new web page is that is necessary, um, and if that content would be more valuable on another page that you already have or or shared in a different way. Um, it's just you know. It, yes. Can I ask a question about that? Yeah. When is it better to do another web page, so a sub page, versus having the the reader have to scroll down? Because we always worry about if they have to scroll, are they going to go down that far? Again? Exactly. Most of them wouldn't, right? So I guess it's going to go back to the goals that you have for a page. And if you're starting to include content that is suddenly making you think that you have two or three goals for a web page, and this information that will live over a longer period of time, then I would say that would um, that would bear on a new page. Um, again, it just depends. If you're really clear on what you want a page to do for you, I think it'll, it'll be easier as you introduce more content if that original intent is suddenly becoming a little bit more diluted. Um, and if you could fill up a brand new page with that information. You know, the other idea could be maybe I, maybe there are other types of content that can also live on this page. Um, you could, so you could broaden the scope to make it more relevant. Um, and again, I know that I'm talking very vaguely here, so I'm happy to answer questions after the presentation, or, or you can email me if there are specific examples that you have. I could be a little bit more, uh, more help to you there. A lot of these are more overriding principles to, to keep in mind. Considering your word count is also an important thing for Google. Um, and again, I know that you guys aren't writing content that is specifically for you know, generating more students and things like that. But um, if you have a valuable piece of content and you want that to rank within a search engine, Google likes more content than less. And so you know, some web pages will have meteor information or pages where you have to scroll down a lot. But they're doing it for audiences that are that they, that they expect them to want to scroll. So, so I'm in marketing, and one of the websites that I go to a lot is called the Content Marketing Institute, and I think any new post that they have is at least a 1,000 words, and they have lots of graphics and images, and, and that's fine because I'm looking to do things that can help my business, so I will read to the bottom um, if, if something is really valuable to me. But you know, an 18 or 22-year-old student, you know, they probably just want the quick and dirty of, of, of the information, so like, right, they don't want to scroll a lot, um, they may not want to click on a lot of different things either, so, uh, and that's okay as long as you know what you want each page to do. Um, but 200 words is kind of like the, the base minimum that, that we talk about on our team um, in terms of if we have enough media content to at least justify a page. And when we're putting out new blog content, we try to make it those 200 words. Um, and again, sometimes it goes over, sometimes we have 400 words, or if it's just kind of a basic thing, um, sometimes it's a little bit less, but more often than not, it's more than 200 words. And then that Google is looking at it more favorably. So if somebody typed in um, academic advising appointment and your page only had 100 words, but it's something that you know could be really valuable, Google may not rank that as highly as a page that has 400 words or, or 300 words on the same topic. And again, you're not writing for search engines. You're not writing to generate new students. But it, it's just something to keep in mind. It's just basic best practices of a web page. Um, do you credit your sources and don't duplicate or plagiarize? <coughs> Those kind of go together. Um, so we talked about the importance of explaining things in your own words, but we all get inspiration and information from other places. So it's not that we can't do that. Um, and if, if there are times when we're just citing pure facts or anything like that, we, we want to make sure that we're giving credit where credit is due, um, and to making sure we credit where that information came from. Um, that's showing the student that it's valid information and it's just. Um, it's good to kind of check in on those sources that you're using to make sure information hasn't changed and, and keeping stats up to date that you are putting out there. Um, and don't duplicate or plagiarize content. Um, we all know it's important to not lift, you know, plagiarism aspect. We know that it's important to not not just take someone else's content 
Um, but Google has a different take on it from, for search engines. Um, and when, the, when, when they are deciding which pages are going to rank higher in a search result, um, and they're looking at pages that are coming from your website, if they see two pages that look very, very similar, they're not going to show both search results to the student. They're going to pick one, and it may not be the one that you want them to see. So that's what's just really important to make sure that you're offering unique information um, on your website across each page. Because you don't want Google to decide for you if, if your students are, are searching for things through Google. You don't want Google to decide which of those pages they're going to see. Um, so it's just a, that's just a good thing to, to keep in mind. Bree? Yeah. I wanted to chime in about word count because I know that's something that we're really you know, stringent about. We're always looking at our pages thinking, oh my gosh, you know, like is a student really going to read all this? Um, one thing that I really like to consider is like how is your content organized on that page? Because, you know, you could have a nice long page and if you organized it with subheadings and, you know, maybe you included a table and you gave, you know, bulleted lists under certain areas, that's going to make it a lot more skimmable for a student to, you know, peruse through that data easily what, rather than looking at, you know, four blocked paragraphs, which may just be too much, and if they can't tell what's going on on that page, we may have lost them at that point. That's a great lead into the easy to read part. So Oops, sorry. Like, no, no, you're good. <laughs> so we will, um, so we will definitely talk more, a little bit more about that. I think I have some examples in here for you. So, an example of, um, so I think this is another, another blog post that we do for one of my schools. I tried really hard to not um, put examples that I had always had a part of, but they're just a lot easier to talk about to you guys. Um, so we know for one of our schools, um, we are trying to convince students um, outside of Las Vegas that coming to Las Vegas for school is a great idea. Um, so we put a blog post around it. And some of the reasons that make Las Vegas so great are, you know, are statistical information that's coming from other sources. So, um, so number two um, talk, is talking about a low cost of living. Um, in the middle of that, number two, we talk about, according to Sperling's Best Places, Nevada's cost of living is below the national average. So not just telling them that, that Nevada has this great staff, but actually saying where it came from so they can check it out for themselves, and then also linking to it from their name. So they can go, again, they can go and see that the source is valid um, and, and see what, how we came to that. It's not just something that we made up um, about Las Vegas. Um, and also career, number three talks about career and salary potential. Um, we reference the Bureau of Labor Statistics a lot to talk about the viability of nursing jobs and what they can do with and salary ranges and things like that. So, you know, Nevada is one of the top paying states in the nation for nurses, so we want our students to know that. So again, we said that the Bureau of Labor Statistics is recognizing Nevada as a top paying state, um, and then taking you know, top paying states in the nation for nurses, um, taking that phrase and then linking it back to the Bureau's website. So again, they can see that this is credible information and that we're not making these stats up. So definitely, you know, definitely crediting our sources here um, and taking all of these different taking different information that we have on this topic and kind of putting it all together in a unique package you know a page like this doesn't live anywhere else on our website um, so just to offer just to offer that up um, another thing when you're looking at the pages that are on your site um, just to see if these pages are doing anything for you um, there's a few pages that live as link directories where it's essentially a student comes to a section and, you, and you're saying, hey, thanks for visiting us. Here are five other websites that you want to go to that would be really valuable for you. Um, I would discourage having a lot of those pages because it's kind of creating filler content for the student. It's just creating another another middleman to, to content that's more important. So you know, just posing the question, what can you give them while they're there that would mean something? And you can still drive them to those sites, but don't make that the purpose of your page. Um, you know, I know everyone's mission statement is very important to them it's, it's a, because it helps us understand how we're operating as a unit, but I would challenge you, you know, what does that mean to the student? So, so they have your mission statement. Is there something that you can say about your mission student that suddenly makes it mean something to, to your student, or does your mission statement not need to be on the website for your department and it's just something that you keep internally to help you guide where you're going? Um, again, if you would ask what a student's getting out of that, you might get a different answer from what, from what you get out of it. And if you have very certain things that you want them to do when they're on your website, the more filler pages that you have, the less likely that a student is to, to take action on the things you actually want them to do when they're there. So if you have a great guide that you want them to download, but they've gotten you know, 
they've got three or four different really short web pages and, and half of them are looking to other pages, you know, they may give up and go look for something else or um, or just maybe a little bit frustrating for them to go from, from A to B to C to D and on and on until they get to the content that they're actually looking for. Easy to read. So this is the, so all the things that Eric said are exactly right. Um, and some of these tie into the things that I've already talked about. So using plain language, again, we'll most of the time writing for 18 to 20 year olds. Sometimes we've got adult learners who are coming back to school, but um, we don't need to use emoticons or LOL or anything like that. But definitely using language that, you know, we think conversational. You know, it can be, you can use a more relaxed tone and still be professional um, and not um, to, get, to get your point across. That's one of the things that I also love about being in higher ed um, as opposed to working for a laboratory or talking to doctors is that you can be a little bit more relaxed and informal with the student and, and they would appreciate that. Stating your point, you know, and so thinking back to essays that we wrote in, in English composition class, where having it at the, having some kind of information at the beginning of the page that sets the tone for what they're going to get, make sure they know why, what they're going to get when they're there. Um, like Eric said, add a visual. Sometimes it's just as simple as dropping a picture. Sometimes it can be more complicated as creating a graph or a table, or if you have a, a graphic designer on staff, they can make a nice infographic for you that has data with pictures. Um, but the visual can be, there are lots of different things that can be. Um, and then including a, a clear call to action at the, in that, at the bottom of the page. Now that the student has read all this information, where do you want them to go next? What do you want them to do? Sorry, I was going to chime in on the ad visuals. I know that you know that's a difficult element for a lot of us looking at a website because you're like, I don't know how to build a table on here, or you know, there may be little tools within the um, what you see is what you get editor, um, but that's something that you can come to our office with. You know, if you want a type of infographic or a type of imagery that you think that would be good on your website, obviously it's going to take planning and time. It's not something that you know I can just go and type in. But you know, us formatting tables or helping look at you know, an, an ordered list uh, of objects or of um, things that you're trying to get across to the student, we can help you look at those, but unfortunately we're not actively constantly looking at your content saying, you know, oh, this needs to be like this, or this needs to be like this. So when you see those or you have ideas about it, talk to us. Um, so that kind of goes A lot of the time, your sentence can be just as effective without without having them. Um, and so, just so I think of a flowery language or, or extra words that make the sentence longer, but may or may not um, add a lot of value. So, our great our great campus center, our excellent customer support, um, those things are, should be applied. So, just making sure that you're really careful on the the way that you're describing your services. Um, and then again, using jargon that your audience may not understand. So, in your case, 18 to 20 year old, 22 year old students. Um, again, relaxed and, and conversational is probably better, and again, can still be professional um, and maybe make it easier to even crank out some of the content that you need to do. And so I have a couple, I think I have one or two examples of that. Um, so again, this is another website that we were a part of. Um, and I think a lot of different elements come into play here. Um, so this is setting up a whole tab on a new website that we did, nursing resources. So, um, so the equivalent. Like if, if they don't know if nursing is right for them or what the benefit is of a nursing career, all of these, ta all of those um, nav items on the side drop down to different, to different pages that talk about that top thing. Um, and so ways that we wanted to make the content more visual, we added a picture of a nurse. Um, we have subheads with well, short um, paragraphs, and those subheads are actually style elements within the, the what you see is what you get, the WYSIWYG editor. So I didn't have to make it italic or pick a color or pick a size. It was something that I worked with our digital department on. So if I want to call out those headlines, I can just select the H2 heading in my WYSIWYG editor and, and use that to um, headline a paragraph. And so kind of um, chunking it up into short, con short paragraphs that are easier to scan through. Or if a student doesn't know where to start, um, they can even just look at the subheads and see if they want to read information that's specific to that paragraph. Um, and then at the bottom of the page, you can do great time to consider nursing. To learn more about the field, download our free career, our free nursing career guide. So, and we can have the same call to action on a lot of different pages. Like this was, this is one of the big things that we want to download. We want students to pick up. 
we are using it as a lead generation tool. So these are not for students that are already here, but it's still a great way to track if people are reading the content. And if we say, hey, all you have to do to get this guide is, is leave your name and your email address. And now we have a way to contact them and follow up with them from a lead standpoint. But we also can track how many people actually wanted that guide and decide if that content so if we, if we got five clicks over five months or, or five downloads, maybe that wasn't the best way to package that information. You know, how can we do it differently? Or if we've got 30 within within one or two months, hey, that did, that did pretty well. What else can we give students that is like this? Because clearly they want information that is like this. And we have, you don't have data to show, to show how that's working for you. So that's what we're a real big fan of, of driving students to physically do something. But again, not every page, you know, is, is leading to a guide. Sometimes it's just, um, if you want to know more about nursing pay, go to this page that talks about you know, top salaries for nurses. Just making sure that you know what you want them to do when they're done, so they just click off the box and, and, and not have a game plan for what they want to do next. Okay, accurate. This is pretty self-explanatory. Um, so keep your facts up to date. We don't even really need to, to talk much about that. Um, when it comes to keeping event dates and any kind of information that may change over this, the course of the calendar year for the following year. We want to make sure that's accurate. Um, I think where it's, it's most helpful to think about is to not duplicate the same piece of, of, of information across multiple pages. So that partly goes into the unique aspect of, of having unique information on your page, but um, it also goes into just creating, to creating an easier update schedule for you. And so I have an example for this. Um, one of the schools that I worked for, um, Orbis is more of a third-party partner, so we work with the, the university, like PR campuses. We work with the PR department to get information to help us get some things on our websites. And they had a packet of financial aid information. It was probably five different things that totaled about 10 or 15 pages. And they had the same they had the same block of content, in about half of them, but it was worded differently each time. And so when it came to the types of websites that they wanted students to visit for more information or um, things like that. It, it was it technically reported differently, but it was the same thing. And so when we decided to put it online, we decided that, that, case, that all that information that is appearing on multiple pages we put in one place. Because guess what? Three months later, when we had to update those websites, those URLs were changed, they were recommending new resources to students. I didn't have to go comb through my pages and figure out how many times did I say that was one thing, how many times did I, did I put that resources section at the bottom of a financial aid page. I knew it was on one page, and so it just made life a lot easier when it came to, to updating things like that. So it's just, um, so there's, there's a lot of different benefits, but um, most importantly for you is so that you don't you don't think that you've touched all the pages on your website that have that piece of content, and you've only updated three out of the five. And so depending on what page a student sees, you know they may or may not be getting the most up to date information. So again, just something to keep in mind to keep your keep your life. So evaluating your web content, um, just different questions to ask for the pages that you already have. Uh, does this page provide my visitors needs first? Um, does it meet the definition of valuable content for university college? Is it helping them take a career path or identify a major or raise their academic profile? Um, would visitors notice if it disappeared? Um, we, I, I can't tell you how many questions, times we've asked ourselves that question as we have taken on new responsibilities in, in different departments they've been a part of. And you know, we get more responsibilities, but we don't get more staff. And so the first thing we go to is, what can we get rid of that, that isn't meaning anything to anybody? Like, you know, whether it's a newsletter or, or web pages or, or, or whatever it is. If, if someone's not going to notice that it's gone, then maybe you don't need to put it up there in the first place. Um, how many clicks did it take you to get to a page? You know, are they all really necessary? Um, you know, they say the fewer clicks to get to a piece of content, the better. I would say a good, a good practice is you know, two or three, maybe four, but I, I'd say three is probably pretty pretty standard. Um, and if you can remove some of those middleman pages so that the student can get to the important information quicker. Yeah. Me again, yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, just to like counter that, um, also thinking about, you know, everything can't fit on the front page, obviously. So if something's seven clicks and we want to move it to the front, that may not be possible. But maybe it's time to look at the organization of what tabs do you have at the top. You know, if you're having to click a lot to get to one area, maybe we can reorganize those, call them different things to where the topics would be a little bit different and get people to all of your content quicker. 
then another question, you know, do visitors understand what I want, what I want them to do when they're here, and are they doing it? Um, so again, that goes back to having some kind of call to action so that once they're done with the page, they have a plan for what to do next. And so this is, these are questions to ask of pages that you may already have. Um, and so questions to ask before creating new content, you know, some of those questions still apply. Again, is this meeting the definition of valuable content? Um, but some of them are different. So what's so you decide you want to put a new web page together. What's lacking on my other pages? Like, does this fit on a page that I already have? Can I just rewrite a page that's already there to either have a bigger focus or, or put some new information out there? Uh, would it be easier to update a page you already have and, and take a new approach for a page you already have before creating a brand new one? Um, again, will people care about this page six months from now? If they don't, maybe it's better to put in a different part of the website. It doesn't have to be in your static navigation. Um, Again, is a web page, web page the most appropriate format? Maybe it is, um, but maybe it needs a more visual treatment, or maybe it needs to, maybe you really want to put together a video topic, uh, a video together that you're pushing out to students so that, again, it's, um, it doesn't have as long of a shelf life if the topic is, is a little more time sensitive. Do I have at least 200 good words to say on this topic? Um, how much time will this page require to stay accurate, and do I have that time? So if you're wanting to list a lot of different resources, you have to try to check those every, you know, every month or every few weeks to make sure that those links are correct. Um, and is that something that you want to spend your time doing? Um, and again, going back to that call to action, what do I want visitors to do once they're here? Um, so again, you can you can you could probably get a million different lists that talk about these same types of things. But I try to create questions that would mean something to you guys in the day in and day out. But this, these are definitely not the be all end all checklists for you. And when it comes to evaluating your web content, um, you know, reach out to each other. You guys all have the same, you guys all have the same purpose, and especially if there are times when you guys might be talking about the same thing, it doesn't have to live in everyone's navigation. If you find a, a department that makes the most sense for that to kind of be the, the core, to be part of the core content. Um, take student, you know, create student surveys. Um, I'm not sure if there are processes for how those are done here, but there are very simple programs like SurveyMonkey and things like that that you can create for free. and. Um, if you want to get feedback from students on the types of information that's most important to them on your site, um, focus groups, again, that can take a little bit more coordination, but maybe you can piggyback on efforts that are already being done um, from the main IUPUI folks. Um, maybe you can submit some questions to them um, that will help you understand how your content is being used. Um, and never overlook website analytics. Um, and I know that Eric is the, is the keyboard host for University College, so you may have questions for him you know, maybe you don't need reports every week or something like that, but that would take a lot of time and, and maybe give you information that you don't need. But, you know, if you're trying to make a decision on which pages are are performing better on your section, you know, you can ask Eric, hey, can you tell me, you know, how long are students spending on this page? Are they are they clicking on it really quickly and then going somewhere else because they, they're they not getting what they want here? Or, or which pages are clicked on the most or which pages do, are driving in more traffic? Um, again, I know you guys are not trying to generate new students necessarily, but current students are finding you in the same way, um, potentially through Google. So it's just good to know how your pages are performing um, from, the search, from the search engine standpoint. Um, and this is just a little um, snippet of the, um, of the Excel template I put together for you. I am not a graphic designer by trade, so it is a very simple little document, but it's just a way that if you were to have you know, an hour or two um, on a Friday and you're, you're trying to think of how to gear up for your website, you know, list your pages in that document and then just ask those questions and kind of type out the answers. They shouldn't be long answers. Um, you know, how is this page helping students? Can you talk about, can you, you know, say five or ten words on it? Um, just so that you're aware on which pages you actually um, value more heavily and pages that maybe can, you know, cycle out of the navigation over time. Um, and again, if we ever decide to take a page out of navigation, you don't want to just delete the page. You can just remove it from the navigation. Um, because you can take hits from Google um, if you're deleting lots of content. Um, and also that some of these four or four pages for students. So if they, let's say it wasn't a page that was sustainable over time, but you had a couple of students going there, they bookmarked it in their browser, and you just deleted it, they now have a dead link that they're going to. And, and so it's just not, to avoid that, you can just take it out of your navigation so new visitors that come um, you, you know, aren't, don't have that as an option. And you can even rewrite it for the ones that are still going there, maybe drive them to a new page that, that has better information for them. So again, I think that this could be you know, a nice thing to do. Um, it may take maybe an hour, hour and a half, not something that would take you all afternoon, just to get a sense for what you feel about 
the content that's on your own site. And this Excel file along with Bree's presentation will be sent out later today. So I talked a lot. So, and I know um, a, a few of you guys had questions. If there are more, I can stay back for a little bit. If you have more questions, um, you can feel free to email me. Um, I check that every day. I'm also on Twitter. If you like Twitter, you can reach out to me that way um, and I can respond to you. Um, like I said, I just really appreciate having the, the chance to talk to you guys. And I hope that I've given you some ideas that at least give you a roadmap for how you want to handle content. Um, and I'll be talking to you guys again um, over the next uh, four to six weeks. So if you have questions, feel free to email me or things that you would like to see in the next presentation, um, feel free to email me that too. Thank you. Does anybody have any specific questions for Bray right now? Well, I have a quick question, but I'm not a recall. I'm looking at your school on campus, so it may not apply to people. But um, I have pages on our website with the Bray Center and the Bray Center 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 you know, they're, they're fine, they serve their purpose, but um, does it hurt anything to have that on there? They're kind of buried, they're kind of time. Um, you know, if, 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 if they're hard to find, and you know, would it hurt a student's experience? Maybe, maybe not, but um, I, I just think from a best, stand, best practice standpoint that you should really be behind the content that you have on your web page. And, it, and it's, it's also one less page for you to worry about because to some extent it has to be updated. So if, I would say if it, it would probably make your life easier um, and maybe make the website experience a little bit a little bit more pleasant so they don't see, you know, if it's showing that list of links from, from 15 to 8, I would say, yeah, there's benefit in removing it. And again, you don't have to delete the page. First, just try it by taking it out of the navigation so a student would only be able to go to it through a bookmark. And if you guys have an intranet, store it there. Like, that's what intranets are for. And if you don't have an intranet, maybe that's, you know, something that if, if, if you guys have a lot of that similar issue going on, maybe that's justification to have an internet. Again, I don't want to speak to, I'm not sure of all the, the different ways that you guys have to archive information, but I would say archive it just so that it's not something you have to worry about someone finding anymore. Thanks. Cool. It doesn't hurt search. No, no, and, and if they were all relevant, I mean, Google likes more than less. So it's it's just a matter of making sure that it's all content that is good for your visitors and not just because maybe it will help Google. <coughs> Google likes pages that are updated a lot and that mean something and are getting traffic, um, getting links to other from other places. So I wouldn't do it just for Google. Any questions? Well, I would challenge you all that, you know, before the next presentation to work on that website strategy to think about, you know, what, what are some sentences, just like our mission statements that really would guide what content goes on your website so you can start using that. And I believe next time we're talking about developing content. Yes. Okay, cool. Thanks again. Thank Welcome back. <laughs> 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 See what happens when I lead the way you guys don't follow. <laughs> 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 <